Well, today we, we come to Romans chapter 9. And so I want to begin today by reading you the first five verses of this chapter. The page number in my Bible, if you're using uh, the Bible that I have, is 945. And let me begin today just by reading you these first opening verses. This is a brand new section in the book of Romans. Paul writes, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all. Blessed forever. Amen. Father God, I do ask your blessing upon this text as it's preached. May your spirit help us to worship you through this word. May your spirit be our guide and our teacher. And so we just want to give this time to you, and I pray that you would speak to us despite our distractions, despite whatever we've brought with us into the room today. Um, we pray knowing that your spirit is, is powerful and your spirit can pierce into our hearts and into our minds and we need that today, and so we ask for it, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Romans 9 focuses attention upon God's sovereign election, and therefore it is a passage that is bathed in controversy. I read a commentator this week, N.T. Wright, he makes this statement, I share this with you, it just, it's memorable to me. He quips that Romans 9 is as full of problems as a hedgehog is full of prickles. And I like that. I have an acquaintance who, years ago, said, told me this story. He said he was on vacation. And while on vacation, Sunday came and he attended church. He attended church in... I don't know how to explain this without using a theological term. He was attending church in an Armenian congregation. Um, that's not Armenia. Armenia is a country near Turkey. Armenian is a theological viewpoint. It's associated with a man by the name of Jacob Arminius. And Jacob Arminius and those who follow that viewpoint, really it comes down to this issue. When you think about your own salvation, if you're a Christian here today, and you ask the question, why am I a Christian? Did you initiate that with God, or did God initiate that with you? And the answer you give to that question really will push you in a direction. Jacob Arminius said, I'm a Christian because I initiated with God. At the end of the day, I am saved because I chose God. And, and this individual, an acquaintance of mine, was, was in a church where that was the viewpoint that was believed. I don't know what kind of church it was, Wesleyan, Nazarene, something along those lines. There are reasons for denominations in this country, and, and we're getting into some waters where there are some divisions. And so my friend was really interested because the pastor was preaching through the book of Romans and last, the Sunday previous, he'd finished Romans 8. So he was going into Romans chapter 9, which I said a moment ago, the, the theme of Romans chapter 9 is, is the sovereign election of God. And so my friend was curious, I'm in a church that doesn't believe that God's election is sovereign, doesn't believe that God is the one who initiates with us, that God is the one who ripens the heart, opens the heart, changes the heart. 
It's really something that we produce by ourselves. And so he's thinking, I'm really glad I'm here on this Sunday. I really want to know what this pastor will have to say as he begins a study of Romans chapter 9. And so the pastor came to the pulpit. If he had a pulpit, I don't know. Maybe he used a music stand, whatever he used. And he said, I spent time this week with Romans chapter 9. This is a true story. I'm not making this up. He said, I've decided we're going to go to Romans chapter 12. And so his answer to this difficult theological question was, we're going to skip it. We're going to skip chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. And we chuckle about that, but I think if we're probably to be knowledgeable about how things happen in church, that's not an isolated story. We really do have this incredible temptation to pick and choose what we teach and what we believe. And part of this is wrapped up in, in things such as, do we fear God or do we fear men? Might I say something today that people don't want to hear? And so there's a great pressure to, uh, to sometimes just skip over. Expository preaching, which is preaching through a book of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, is a safe way to help you from that temptation. But in the story I just told to you, the pastor just said, I don't want to deal with this. I don't know that my people want to deal with this, so we're just going to move forward to chapter 12. I hope you agree with me that that is not a God-honoring approach. And so we're coming to a very difficult topic, but for today, to understand this, to get, a, to get some idea of the foundation of what Paul is thinking in Romans chapter 9 and where he wants to go with this discussion, there is, I think, a, a really important pivotal question that we need to ask and we need to listen to Paul as he answers this question. So let me give you the question. Here it is. The key question, I think, of the text today, and really probably of all of chapter 9 of the book of Romans. This is why Paul pins Romans 9. Okay, What provoked him to write Romans 9? I'm suggesting to you, this is the question he's dealing with. Here it is. Have God's great saving promises to Israel failed? Now we're coming out of Romans chapter 8, so there is a connection at this point. Romans chapter 8 has reminded us in great detail of many of the saving promises of God and how we are to latch hold of those, believe them, Great hope comes from them. There is no condemnation and no separation. Can we believe that? Do you believe that? Why do you believe that? Well, do the saving promises of God, or is that something we can really trust in? Or, to get to Paul's question as he comes into Romans 9, Romans chapter 9, have the saving promises of God for Israel failed? You know, Paul could simply come to church, however they did that in a first century context, probably not like we do it, probably in the context of a home in most situations, but, but he could simply count noses. He could take attendance. Remember in the old days in Sunday school you had the attendance book. Some churches probably still do that. You put a check, you know. But Paul could just simply do attendance, and he could look at people and say, all right, Gentile, 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 there's a Jew. Another Gentile, another Gentile. Gentile, Gentile, there's a Jew. It seems like the promises of God have indeed failed. Because the Jews are not in the church, they're not following Christ, they're still in the synagogue. The Old Testament is full of promises that God has made to this group of people, but we do not see this group of people following after Christ. Hence the question. 
If we're going to get anywhere with Romans chapter 9, I think we have to understand that that's the question that leads Paul into this deep water discussion of the sovereignty of God in salvation, of election, of the purposes of God. So that's where we're going to be going over the next number of weeks. But Paul begins, and so I want to begin where he does, by reading again to you the first three verses. Paul begins with great sorrow. It's really quite remarkable what he says here. He says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. Several times here, Paul mentions truth. I am not lying. This idea that I am earnest, I am telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth in Christ. The Holy Spirit is my witness. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Paul elsewhere says in 2 Corinthians that he is always sorrowful and rejoicing. Or did I reverse it? Is it always rejoicing and sorrowing? I think it's the first way. It doesn't really matter. Paul says that as he thinks about the gospel, that gives him hope and causes him to rejoice. And yet at the very same time that he lives a life that is marked by joy, Paul does not think there's any contradiction here to say, I am sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. He experiences great sorrow, and it is rooted in what I might call a principle of proximity. We love people, we love those who are closest to us the best, don't we? This is true, isn't it? It's just undeniable with how we're made. My mind is just thinking random thoughts right now, but I'll draw attention to these powerhouse women because they are really good about giving us prayer requests. Last Sunday there were eight or nine of them. Today there's only three. But when they give prayer requests, what do you think they focus on? Their children, if they have children. Their parents. In other words, they ask us to pray for those who are closest to them. And we understand this, don't we? Because we love all people, but we love our children more than we love other people. And so Paul here, when he says, I feel unceasing anguish in my heart, he mentions it's because of his kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul is a Jew. And most Jewish people are outside of Christ. You see, the whole issue here is salvation, isn't it? Paul doesn't exactly state it that way, but the implication is clear here that salvation for the Jew and the Gentile comes through Christ. And his kinsmen, according to the flesh, who he cares deeply for, who he loves, they are outside of Christ. He makes this really remarkable statement, verse 3, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. That word accursed, it's, it's the Greek word anathema. You could actually translate it that way because we do, that word comes into English. But the word is used quite frequently in the Old Testament in the context of the conquest of the land. So, for instance, Joshua. When Joshua comes into the promised land, he is given instructions to destroy the pagan Canaanite culture that is living in that land, isn't he? You know the story, I assume if you grew up in Sunday school, of the, the walls of Jericho coming down. That word is used in that text in the context of destroying those Gentile pagan peoples. You could render here in this text as damned. 
Paul is saying that if he could, he would wish himself damned in the sight of God if that would bring about the salvation of his kinsmen according to the flesh. Now, I am very grateful that these verses are here in our Bibles at the very beginning of a discussion about sovereign election because it reminds us that Paul is not some theologian living somewhere in an ivory tower removed from people and removed from relationships. No, rather Paul is a pastor. He cares about people. He loves people. And Paul is writing these words with tears in his eyes. We can understand this, can't we? When sovereign election comes up, the question that always accompanies it, in my own experience of talking to people, why this is so hard for people is that I have loved ones who are not followers of Jesus. Are they elect or are they not? And so Paul begins here with a reminder that Paul also experienced true anguish of heart as he thought about people who were outside of Christ. I've mentioned over the years my grandfather on my mother's side. His name was Ed. He grew up in Oregon City, and he grew up in a cult. That cult is called the Followers of Christ. Have you ever heard of them? They occasionally will make the news cycle, and they make the news cycle because they do not believe in doctors. And so every couple of years you will hear of a child in this group that has died because the family would not take the child to receive medical care. My grandfather grew up in that cult, and he left it as a young man. And he went to his grave with a deep distrust, and I would say a hostility towards any form of organized religion. Never went to church. I did his funeral because he didn't have a pastor. I can remember on several occasions... One memory is the most vivid. It was in McCall, Idaho, at a picnic table near the lake there, where I pleaded with my grandfather for his soul. And I remember he was in tears. He was in tears because he knew that I loved him intensely. I performed his funeral without having any assurance of my grandfather's faith or lack of faith in Christ. And I think all of us understand this. All of us have relationships and we have people we care about and we love and we want them to be in heaven with us. And and so this whole issue of, of God initiating salvation, does he do this? How does he do this? Is it in his hands? Is it in our hands? We've got skin in the game with all of this. And that's why it makes the topic so difficult. I experienced this sorrow in a more limited way just a week ago. I mentioned last Sunday that the Mormon missionaries came to my house. Four very zealous young men. I told them that. I said, I admire your commitment. I knew they were coming. And so when they sat down, I asked them a question. I said, can you tell me who made this statement? And I knew that they would know the answer. Here's the statement. As we are, God once was. As God is, so we shall become. Anybody here know who made that statement? Be careful. It's not Joseph Smith. Snow. I believe he's the third prophet within Mormonism. But he is articulating clearly what Joseph Smith believed and what is taught in the Book of Mormon. It's just a very memorable way 
of stating something significant about what Mormonism does believe and teach. I said to those young men, if you get God right, you get everything else right. If you get God wrong, you get everything else wrong, including yourself. As we are, God once was. What does that mean? It means that God is simply a man. He's an exalted man. He's an evolved man. But God was just a man. That means he was as fallible, as small, as ignorant as all of us are at this moment. That's their God. As we are, God once was. God's a created being. God has a father and a mother. Did you know that? And those people, they have a father and a mother. And there's a father and mother before them, and a father and mother before them. So there's an infinite regression of beings, all of whom are created, all of whom are finite, all of whom are growing in wisdom and knowledge. And this leads to the person that the Mormons refer to as God, who himself is on a pilgrimage to greater knowledge and greater understanding as he evolves upward into Deity. As we are, God once was. As weak and fallible, needy and dependent as you are at this moment. And as God is, so we shall become. This God who sort of in an evolutionary way has evolved up into exaltation so that now we worship an exalted man and he rules over a world so you also can someday rule over a world and you can become a God yourself. I took them to Isaiah chapter 43. Let me read to you that text. Isaiah chapter 43, the end of verse 10, and then the, the totality of verse 11. This is what the Bible says. Does this agree with Mormon doctrine? The Bible says, God says through his word, page 604, before me no God was formed. Did you hear that? Did you understand it? Is it clear to you? Do you need special knowledge to interpret those words? Maybe we're just not smart enough. No, the words are clear and they mean what they say. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord and besides me there is no Savior. Or Isaiah 44 and verse 6, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Or 44 and verse 8, Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. Before me, no God was formed, and there will be no God formed after me. I know that those Mormon missionaries are deceived, and I know they are deceived because of their doctrinal affirmation coming out of the pages of Scripture. 
But you know, in talking to them, they left, and I felt as if I'd made little impact upon them. Because after all of that conversation, they simply told me, God has subjectively revealed to me the truth of Mormonism. So objective arguments apparently be damned. How can you argue with a subjective argument? This is what the Bible says, and this is what the Book of Mormon says. They cannot be reconciled. And so you claim to believe the Bible, but the Bible says something that cannot be reconciled with your faith. This is an objective reality that we're considering at this moment. And your response to me is, I know it's true because God says to my heart, I've had the burning of the bosom that this is true. I simply share that with you for two reasons. One, there are many, many Mormons in our community. Your kids rub shoulders with them all the time. And so be aware, I am sick and tired of having Christians say to me, there is no difference really between an evangelical classical Christian and a Mormon. They're just another variety of Christian. That is a statement that is verifiably untrue. So I'm warning you, in that sense, but I'm also sharing this with you because when they left, I felt sorrow in my heart because I care about them. I had no reason or desire to try to win a theological argument with them. It was not a fair fight. I'm 50 years old. I've been reading the Bible my entire life. These were a bunch of 18-year-old boys, on the way to being men. It was not a fair fight. It also wasn't a fight. See, I care for their souls. And so we understand this whole issue, and we understand it because of this, this principle of proximity. The closer a person is to me, by blood or by relationship, the more I love them and the more I care about them, but I care about people I don't even know like the Mormon missionaries. And so I hope that we can agree with Paul when we read these words. I understand sorrow. And I understand this, this desire that people would repent and come to know Christ. Martin Luther makes this comment. Let me just read this to you because I am, I am in awe of verse 3. I am not claiming that verse for myself. Luther makes this statement. He says, It seems incredible that a man would desire to be damned in order that the damned might be saved. And so when the Mormon missionaries come to your door, I hope they leave. And when they get into their car or when they walk down the street, I hope they're able to say, I think that person loves us. He might have hammered us. He might have took a sledgehammer to our belief system, but you know I think he loves us. They should say that about you. And you should also be prepared to meet them and to engage them. And if you're not, you need to prepare yourself. Regardless of whether it's the Mormons, whoever it is. Do we know enough to defend our faith? Do we know what we believe? And do we love truth enough to proclaim it? Paul is this person who clearly does. So, we've talked about his great sorrow. Now, in verses 4 and 5... Paul makes mention of the great privilege which the Jewish people enjoyed. And he lists here in these verses eight specific privileges. So I want to read these verses to you and then make some brief observations. So chapter 9 and verse 4. They are Israelites and to them belong the adoption of 
the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Do you understand the logic here? The question, have the saving promises of God failed for Israel? And so it is logical that Paul would would entertain these thoughts, consider all the spiritual privileges that were given to that people. And so he lists them. He could probably add to this list, but there are eight here. He makes mention of adoption. Paul has had a lot to say about adoption back in chapter 8, hasn't he? Do you remember some of that? Chapter 8, verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, reads as follows, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So in the Old Testament, Israel is sometimes presented in a relationship with God whereby he is their father and they are his sons and his daughters. Have the promises of God failed? I hope you begin to feel the weight of some of this. Are we really secure in Christ? We talk about eternal security. Do we believe it? They are Israelites to whom belong the adoption. And he says, the glory. When I hear the word glory, what my mind thinks of is the wilderness wandering. The plaguing of the Egyptians and God parting the Red Sea and bringing the children of Israel into that desert land and how he provided for them and how that glory cloud led them through the wilderness and they followed that cloud. And how the glory later filled the tabernacle and then the temple so the priests could no longer minister within those structures because the powerful presence of God was there. The children of Israel experienced this. They saw it. Another often objection to Christianity is God seemed so silent. If he just showed up with fireworks, that would make the difference. Well, the children of Israel saw the fireworks, and most of them are outside of Christ. And they're not worshiping God. They're in the synagogue. They're rejecting Christ. The glory of God can be defined this way. It is the holiness of God on public display for people to see and to be in awe over. They saw the glory of God. To them belong the adoption, the covenants, the glory. The covenants. Think of all the great promises that God made in the Old Testament to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. I've been reading in Genesis again with a group of men. And being reminded of those covenants that it's made to Abraham and it's reaffirmed to to his sons. The covenant made to Moses and the children of Israel. The covenant made with King David. These binding promises that God made to this people. Have the promises of God failed? What are we to make of this? The giving of the law. Mount Sinai, you know that story. The worship. Temple worship, tabernacle worship. All the promises of the Old Testament. To them belong the patriarchs. When you read Exodus chapter 3, that text which narrates that God has seen the misery of Israel. He has heard their cry and he is coming forth to deliver them. The text says that he is doing this in large measure because he remembers the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. 
The God who does not forget, the God who is faithful to his promises. And we could read the Old Testament. I hope you do read the Old Testament. It's full of promises of a coming Christ, of a coming Messiah. And now Jesus has come, and he's been rejected by the Jews, and they are hard in their rejection of him. Paul makes a statement here. It's made almost in passing, but it does lead him immediately to doxology. It's a remarkable statement. It's unusual, actually, the way Paul states this with such clarity. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ. Who is this Christ? Paul answers this way, Jesus Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. It's a remarkable statement, one of the strongest statements you will find anywhere in the Bible affirming the full deity of Jesus. And the ESV renders it rightly. So in every way, the Jewish people were greatly privileged. And again, we're circling back to where I started. We're in church in the first century, and you know who's conspicuous by their absence? The Jewish people. And they're not off fishing. They're not off watching football or gladiators. They're not just indifferent. You can stay home and watch football because you know what? You just prefer football to God. A lot of people would say, I'm not, I'm not really hostile to God. I just I prefer football. And so I'm just showing my preference. No, the Jews were more than that. They were openly hostile to Christ. And so as we conclude this morning, recognizing we're just beginning a much bigger discussion that will be filled out in weeks to come, how do we answer the question, at least in a preliminary way, as we close, Have the saving promises of God failed? I hope you feel the weight of it. I hope I've sufficiently communicated to feel the weight of it. And I hope you also recognize that this is important for me and my life at this moment. Because I claim to be part of the family of God. And I say God is my father. And I say I'm accepted. And I'm significant. And I'm secure. And I've tried to bathe myself in the comforting waters of Romans chapter 8. Is it true? Can I really believe this? What if it all fails? And I can suggest two possible answers to this question. Number one. The promises of God for Israel's salvation were not realized because they refused to repent and to believe. Now, we could say more about that, but what I'm going to simply say this morning is that that is not the Paul, that is not the argument that Paul makes in Romans 9. It isn't. Paul does not make that argument in Romans chapter 9. So what argument does Paul make? Instead, Paul argues, as we'll see more fully in coming weeks, that the promises of God have been and are being fully kept. That's his argument. None of God's promises can fail. And why is this? Because he's God. That's precisely the right answer. That was exactly what I was going to say. If the promises of God fail, he's not God. Because he's not sovereign. He's not able. He doesn't have the right stuff to accomplish what he says he will accomplish. If the promises of God fail, he is not God. He's not the God of the Bible, that's for sure. 
See, Paul's whole argument going forward in Romans chapter 9 is that the promises of God have been fully kept. They will be fully kept. They cannot not be fully kept. So look at what he actually does say in verse 6 and 7 and 8, and then we're going to come back to this next Sunday. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. You see, that's, that's what I've interpreted here. Have the promises, the saving promises of God failed? That's what Paul's addressing here. It is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Now let me add some other words here that I think they're words that belong because they're all throughout Romans chapter 9. The children of God, we call that spiritual Israel. The children of God are the elect. The children of God are the remnant whom God has chosen and God, whom God keeps. Romans chapter 11 and verse 5. So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen, chosen by grace. Have the promises of God failed? May it never be. As we'll see in coming weeks, just because you have the blood of Abraham in your veins does not make you a true Jew. It does not mean that God is in covenant with you. We call them Edomites. Who was their father? Anybody know? Anybody? I heard it. Esau. Is Esau a son of Abraham? Does he have the blood of Abraham in his veins? Yes, he does. But he's not in covenant with God. I would put it this way. He is not part of the elect. He is not part of spiritual Israel. He is not part of the remnant whom God has chosen and with whom God will keep his promises. In other words... It is impossible for us to throw a wrench in the saving purposes of God and destroy the whole thing. Aren't you grateful that that is the case? If ultimately your salvation was on your shoulders, do you really think you've got the right stuff to see it through? No, we'd all be throwing wrenches in God's plan of salvation. And God would be up there in heaven ripping his proverbial hair out. Going to plan B and going to plan C. God doesn't have a plan B and God doesn't need a plan C. God has a plan A. God is telling a story. It's God's story. It's not our story. God writes a role for us in this story. I've said this before, but we need to remember that the word author and the word authority are almost the same word, aren't they? Authority has the word author in the the core of it. So God is telling a story, and, and God is not revolving around you and your story. And we should rejoice in that. And so it is impossible for us to throw a wrench in God's saving purposes and plans and just destroy what he is doing. Because God is sovereign. Because God is God. And I think we should rejoice much in this truth. As we explore this, we'll find much mystery here. But at the end of the day, when you look at yourself, At the end of the day, when you pray for your unsaved relatives, how do you pray for them? You probably say something like this, God, save them. God, open their hearts. 
God, do what I cannot do and what no one else can do. And when you look at yourself, I would assume you say the same things. You say, oh, what a great God who has saved me. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I do just commit these words to you today. They are your words. They're not my words. The text of Scripture is your word. We submit to your word. And we ask, may your Holy Spirit come and convict us of your word. Father God, I pray that as as we think about our own situation, and if we are truly in the family of God, if we are part of the remnant, if we are part of spiritual Israel, if we're part of that believing group of people who come into relationship with you through Christ, if that's true of us, Lord, I I pray that we would recognize the incredible privileges that we've received and that we would rejoice much in them. So we just commit ourselves to you and we ask you to use your word in our lives as you see fit. May you be glorified in all of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.